Welcome to another inspirational message from Chowdean Community Church, Gateshead. For more information about Chowdean, visit www.chowdean.org.uk. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Um, I'd like to invite John up. Um, It's a great pleasure to be introducing um, John to come and continue our series in in looking at the the rules for life and the rules um, that we that we um, try and live our lives by. Um, One of the joys of being in this church is there's so many inspirational people of all ages and throughout this church. There's so many people you can look at elements of their life and say. I could be more like Jesus if I live a bit more like them. And it, that's one of the great things. And John is one of the chief of those people, one of the chief inspirations for me personally and for many I know in this church, um, a great example. Um, both the wisdom of many years, but the joy of a child. I don't know how you do it, John. You, 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 you welcome change. You know, some old people are like, repel change, but John... Is both very wise and welcomes new things with a kind of joy and a, and, a, and a really... So it's great to hear him, always great to hear him. So I'll just start by praying for John. Thank you so much. Um, and welcome him to the pulpit this morning. Thank you, Lord God, that you know our hearts and that you have a word for each one of us this morning. You want to change us and inspire us to be more like Jesus today. Thank you that you have prepared John and that you've given him a word. I just pray you'll speak it through him and you will speak it into our hearts that we might be changed, that we might be different, that we might be inspired and we might live out your love in Gateshead this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Seth. <clears throat> good, good morning, everyone. It's um, <clears throat> so nice to have this opportunity of bringing to an end, really, on Advent Sunday. I know it's Advent too, but we're bringing to an end what has been a very um, wonderful series uh, under the title Blueprint for Living. And I hope, like I found anyway, you have found a lot of practical wisdom to help you in your Christian walk. I know it's not about law. We're not technically under law. We'll perhaps say something about that in a moment. We're under grace, and that's been wonderfully amplified, I feel, by Corinne this morning, and the story that she brought to us is one of grace. Not the strict letter of the law, but the generous giving and accepting of everyone and seeking to make this world a better place. Now we as Christians know that... um, we're not going to make this world a better place by human effort. We don't need something more than that. But I tell you something now, this world would be a much, much worse place if it wasn't for effort and for these charities, who many of them have a Christian origin, but not all, who go out and seek to alleviate suffering and seek to make the world a better place. And that's important. You imagine what it would be like in this world if we didn't have a police force, if we didn't have order. It would be utter chaos. It would be terrible. We wouldn't be able to go out into the streets. But we thank God that although these agencies of law and order are not going to be the final solution for this world and its brokenness, they are a wonderful means used by God to control things until that day dawns when Christ shall return and there will be a new world order and peace will reign. Jesus did that in a wonderful way because he in a sense came and often people have said he brought the new law in the New Testament when he spoke on the Sermon on the Mount. Well, I just need to remind you you that that was a sermon, not a piece of legislation. And you'll notice that what Jesus said was, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacekeepers. You see, the pure in heart are not going about go about committing adultery. The peacemakers are not going around killing people. It's all about a change of heart, 
It's necessary and not an imposition of legislation that will do the trick. But we need that at this time because we need to have the evil that exists in our world under some form of control. It's not a total control, but there is some form of control. In fact, we have friends from Iraq and um, many of them would say to you that things were better under Saddam. Now, now, that wasn't a suggestion that his rule was beneficent or kind or wholesome. It was uh, very, very, um, very much the opposite. But at least there was an order. People could go about their daily lives. Thank God we've heard today, haven't we, that the ISIS has been defeated largely as far as the public aspect of it is concerned in Iraq, and it seems to be free from that, but not free from the ideology. But that's not a, my brief this morning to talk about that. We've had a wonderful series. You remember how Terry, at the very beginning, reminded us, if ever we need a reminding, that it's about God being first in our lives. Then Corian reminded us about the worship of God as something that brings delight and joy and blessing. Something very positive. Paul reminded us to keep God's name holy because God's name is linked with his character. And when we speak that in any light fashion, we forget about the character and the nature of God. Then we have Janice telling us about the importance of family life and the reverence that we should have for one another and in our relationships. Then Terry came and he said that we should not kill or murder. And he took that much beyond the, what we might think of, well, that wouldn't apply to me. We found that, uh, that we can assassinate people and cause pain and hurt by our words. Then Ruth came with that very uh, strong message on not to commit adultery and the hurt and pain that that causes. So we've been reminded of these things. Stuart told us not to steal. In fact, I felt what came out of that talk was much, not so much about stealing, but about giving. That's the antidote to stealing. Sam told us about the truth, to speak the truth. But his final word was that we speak that truth in love. And then Heather took my place, really, because I was to speak on the fourth commandment, and Heather was to speak on the final commandment, which is the tenth, which is for today. But because Ruth was poorly, she took, very kindly took my position, place, and she spoke to us about not coveting, not wanting what we don't have. Learning in some way or other to be content and to thank God for his blessings. Today we then come to this whole talk on remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And that sounds pretty threatening, doesn't it? It sounds rather miserable. And we need to remember that God didn't give these laws to make us miserable. He gave us them to make us happy. He wanted us to have a good life, not a bad life. He didn't want to restrict us. He wanted to give us the freedom to enjoy life as we were originally meant to do so. So in this blueprint for living, respect for the Sabbath day, respect for the rhythm of life. That's what God was saying. He says, listen, work is essential. In fact, I was talking to someone the other day, and I was saying that we have a duty to live. Do you realize that? We have a duty to live. Laziness is condemned in Scripture, and it's wrong, and I'll tell you why it's wrong, because it's a waste of life. You and I, whatever position is today, however restricted our environment or our difficulties, are called upon to live, live life. Fill the minute with 60 seconds. We've no excuse. Whatever our position is today, live. Now, I know that's going to mean different things to different people, but it certainly means this, you don't give up. And laziness is condemned all around. We're here, and we have a duty to live and not to give up. The Sabbath day, therefore, is part of this rhythm of life, of work and rest. Work and rest. You can't continually work and not rest. No more can you const constantly breathe out without breathing in. You need that order, that rhythm. And the seventh day was given for that purpose. 
so that although they would work six days, not even five, mind you, in those days, and they're a desert community, they worked six days, but there was one day that was special. And this was a day of rest, a day of refreshment, a day of recreation. Although that's not the strength of the word. The word actually, Sabbath, means stop. It's a cessation. It's stop doing what you usually do and do something different. Have a rest. Have a break. And whenever any society has tried to overrule that particular principle, they've run foul. Even in Russia, when the first communists began, they had this idea of not having this six days and then resting. And they had to come back to it in a form or other, one form or another. It is essential. But that idea of resting and this Sabbath rest took upon it over the years, it was added so that it ceased to be a blessing and it became a burden. And that's always the case with us and really with people. We, we, we take and we're well-meaning and we do good things, but unless the heart is in it, unless the spirit is in it, the letter of the law kills, New Testament teaches us. The letter of the law kills. If you constantly work on the letter of the law, you run into real problems. It's the same in the church. If you demand certain standards and ignore people, you're running into great trouble. You're running a bureaucracy. A church is meant to be a hospital in some senses, where people are cared for, nurtured, strengthened, educated, You do it with patience and love. You seek to build people up. People matter more than programs. People matter more than things. People are the reason for our being and existence. That's why such charities as we've been hearing today of Aquila and others are so important. They remind us again and again, forget about the order and get round to where people are, meet need. That was always God's thinking. When, when we come into the New Testament, we need a New Testament. The Old Testament didn't work for different reasons. It worked because law is constantly, well, we know what we do with law. Wet paint, do not touch. Isn't that true? There's a rebellious streak in human nature. Listen. God comes into the Garden of Eden and he says, you can eat of every tree in the garden. What a choice. It seemed almost unlimited. It wasn't. There was one area of prohibition. One tree don't eat. Which is the tree they go for? It's in human nature, isn't it? Funny old thing. Law is a strange thing. And if you constantly just enforce law often run into problems where people will oppose it. And you need to be very careful in legislation as to what laws you choose. Law-making is a very, very interesting, very involved business. If you give a wrong law, you'll make a lot of problems for yourself. Laws have got to be very carefully constructed. And so we find that People were doing this with the law, and the law became burdensome, and they were adding things onto it. And then Jesus comes along. And he says, he he doesn't say the law is wrong or rubbish. He says the law is perfect. It's wonderful. Thank God for the law. But I tell you something now, can it do what you need? You see, the law, the Bible tells us, is like a mirror. When we look into the law, we start looking in a mirror. We see our face is dirty. Or we need a wash, or our hair needs combing. But it does nothing about combing your hair, or grooming you, or washing you. It can it. That's not its nature. Its nature is to point out what is not right. What we need to know is, give me the strength to do what is right. Give me some energy. Give me some means. Give me some... provide with me with something whereby I can do the right and not the wrong. Remember what Paul said? He said, I find what I do, when I want to do good, evil is present with me. It's a strange thing, isn't it? We want to be good, but somehow or other we cannot. There's something pulling us down. There's a force of gravity that keeps us to the ground. 
And many of us, have, I think probably all of us today, we all want to keep Sunday special, that's why we're here. It's a great opportunity for us, but we all, I'm sure, in our lives have wanted to be better than what we are. I think was it Seth was saying something this morning along these lines, and it made me think of someone who said, don't look back at what you've been. Look forward to what you've never been. In every human heart here today, there is a potential that is undreamed of. You can be different. Well, we know that if you need the power of Christ to do it, but let me just get back to this law again, because the law, as Jesus shows us, is, and then the Sermon on the Mount is not like, a, like an ordnance survey where you've got to cover every little neat turning. It, it's more of a compass. It's more of a principle of living, the true north. And Jesus said in these words here, he said to the... To the um, to the people that went. Let me read this story if I can. Um, one Sabbath day, Jesus was going through the cornfields, and on his dis- and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some ears of corn. The Pharisees said to them, "Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath?" And he answered, "Have you never read what David did and his companions? They were hungry, and they took the bread that only the priests could eat." They took the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. Then they said to him, the Sabbath was made, sorry, then he said to them, now listen to this, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Get a hold of that if you can today. God loves you. People matter more to him than laws. People are precious to him. He died for people like you and me. He loves us. He cares for us. The Sabbath was not made for man, not man for the Sabbath, but man, sorry, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. It's a very interesting, but Psalm 92 is a psalm that was always read on on a Sabbath day. It's a Sabbath psalm, and it's it's a lovely psalm. Isn't what it says? You wouldn't think it, but because we often think of Sabbath as being a pretty miserable occasion, but it certainly wasn't for them. It says in Psalm 92. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night, to the music of the ten-string lyre, the melody of the harp, You make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. How great are your works, how profound your thoughts. He goes on to say, and then he talks about this, he talks about the old people. He said, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. The Sabbath was made for you, my friend, so that you might find a time of rest and refreshment. You may again just reflect upon God's goodness for you and rejoice in him. That was meant to be the Sabbath day but it wasn't working in the Old Testament. So Jesus reinterprets it. The Sabbath, he says, was never... And sorry, I didn't read all the scriptures. I don't have time to do it now. But do you remember that he healed on the Sabbath? And he didn't object to the... And then when they objected to the men getting their food to eat, a little refreshment on the way, taking the, 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 the corn, he said, listen. Now, he's just drawn these conclusions from it. The Sabbath Sabbath was never intended to prevent some relieving of... Sorry. The Sabbath was never intended to prevent someone relieving suffering. Yet they had it that way. They didn't mind taking an ox if their ox fell uh, into a ditch, pulling that out, but a human being wasn't meant to be healed on a Sabbath. It's ridiculous. Never meant you shouldn't help someone in need. It never meant that you have to go hungry. In fact, under the old law, when Jesus, when they introduced the Sabbath day, they they were, as you remember, he provided twice the amount of food they needed 
on a Saturday to cover them for the Sunday. There's no idea of prohibition or of making life difficult. God is a generous God. He's a giving God, as we've all found it. And many times, Peter, like we make our protestations of loyalty to God, we say how much we love him on a Sunday, and then we can miserably fail you in the, in the week that follows. And then we come back and we experience the generous, forgiving love of God. What a blessed people, you know. We really are. What a wonderfully blessed people. And we rejoice in that today. And we give thanks to God. Legalism has got no place amongst us. We belong to the, the love of God. The Old Testament is all about law um, and the importation, imp, imposition of legislation to change behavior. But we've discovered that that's not the answer. It's not that the law fails. The law's good. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, he said the law failed because of the weakness of human flesh. It wasn't the teaching that was wrong. It was the taught that were wrong. Me, for instance, we're all affected by it. We're all Jock Thompson's bends. We've all fallen below the standards that God sets for us, some to a greater degree than others. I accept that. But we've all failed. We all do fail. It's not within us to lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We need someone else to come and help us and lift us and change us and give us a new dimension to life. And that's precisely where grace comes in because that's exactly what God did. In the person of Jesus, he came into our world. He did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. On the cross, he bore the burden and the judgment that our sins deserved. He died for us, but he did more than die for us. He rose again on the third day so that we could have the impartation of a new life, a new beginning, a new creation. Way back in the Old Testament, when I think of dear David, David, that man of God, man after God's own heart, who came and he took on the giant. I wish sometimes I had David's faith. He came there with that sling and he took the giant out. So committed to God he was. He said, you should defy my, my God the Lord, my shepherd, you deny him. And he took him on. And then we know David much later on in his life, through Bathsheba, as we were reminded with, by Ruth, he broke every commandment except the first four. He killed. He stole another man's wife. He coveted something that wasn't his. You, you can see it all the way through. He broke every commandment. Humanly speaking, we can't do it. And he cried out in Psalm 51, that psalm of confession, and he said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And that's exactly what Christianity offers. It offers a new way of life today. You might have been struggling, doing your best, and trying hard to meet the commandments, and you failed and you many times feel quite miserable about that. I want to invite you today to come to Christ. To come to the foot of the cross and say, Lord Jesus, I know you loved me and you've given yourself for me and I now want to give myself to you. And I'll tell you what the consequence of that will be. That out of gratitude you'll begin to keep the law. That's the way it works. We need a change in here. It's not enough to go out saying, I'm going to change my mind or I'm going to turn over a new leaf. You need to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. And I must finish now, but let me say this. To have an encounter with Jesus Christ is not enough in itself. It's part of a process. When you, be, when you become a Christian, you're forgiven. Right there and then, the, the past is cleansed and forgiven. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. But you need more than that. You need to have a, a power infill of the Holy Spirit to help you now live away in the way that Christ wants you to live. This is the point I'm getting to. You don't do that as a one-off. That needs to be done every day of your life. Oh yes, you, 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 may, you may forget that. You may walk away from God. You may walk for years as it were in the wilderness not knowing Him. But you'll never know the fullness of the power of the Spirit unless it's a daily encounter with Him. We need that every day, in the morning, whenever it can be done. I know from experience. 
I know from experience, for a little while now, for about two months, we've had a, a change of order to our days. And we, we've, we've, we live uh, with um, broadband. We haven't even got broadband. And for, I'm definitely denied, for six or seven weeks we've not had um, Nicky Gumbel each day. We, we, we usually have that as, a, as our morning time. We can't get it. You miss it. You get out of a routine. And I was just thinking last night, Lord, that's it. Every moment of every day, every hour. So if you put two hours at the television, you need to break off during the adverts and run into your corner and just talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to keep in touch with you. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I want you to live in me because there's no other way to live a godly life without that constant touch. You know, the old trams, some of you are far too young to remember them, but the old trams used to run along with the, the lioness. You imagine when they took the power off? It stopped. It's just the same. Now listen, this is not God saying, I want you to be a miserable so-and-so. I want to make your life really unpleasant. This is God saying, you're my dear child. Won't you listen to me? I love you. I want to carry you through life. I want to help you to live life to the full. I want even in your old age to be having fruit until that day comes when I take you into my, into my presence myself and I've got all the means that you need. You need the Holy Spirit in your life. You need to walk in him. Walk in him. Live in him. Breathe him in. You need that desperately. And that's the only way you can keep going. The rest is, you become, well, you're converted. You know the, you know the truth. But it's, never, it's not making much change in your life or your lifestyle. It's not increased your giving. You're still very selfish and self-centered and demanding your own way and criticizing and complaining. What's gone wrong? That's the old life. Where's the new life? Oh, the new life isn't within your power or grasp. The new life is in the spirit. You've got disconnected with the head. So, my word this morning is get connected. And then, when you get connected, this wonderful thing is, all of these wonderful commands that you've been reading will all come into being. You love the Lord with all your heart. You'll worship him, as we've done this morning. You'll be rejoicing and praising. And I saw people, as we're worshiping this morning, lifting up their hands. They're enjoying the presence of God. Not enduring it, enjoying it. And they're walking in newness of life. And they're breathing in a different air. And when they meet with others who are broken, they have something to offer them. Hope and faith and trust and belief. And then they've got an abundance. And out of that abundance, they flow into places like Aquila and other wonderful charities. And they, out of the abundance of their heart, they share with others who are desperately in need and people that you would like probably normally to, forgot, to forget actually exist. And I know many of you are going there on a, Sunday, on a Friday night in the cold and you're standing serving your coffee and you're trying to witness to people and show the love of Christ and you're doing that with the toddlers and you're doing that in the Sunday school. And by the way, I thought there was a lot more adults went back to the party this morning that usually goes out. <laughs> but God wants us to have a party. Jesus is with them and he's with you and with me. So let's this morning pack in trying to do our own thing, trying to be religious. And let's just hand over to God and say, Lord, I'm a living person who needs your touch this morning, needs your forgiveness. Come now and forgive me, cleanse me, and fill me with your spirit. Now, you may have been forgiven, so you don't need, in a sense, to have a whole conversion experience again, but you need a new consecration today as you lay your life before him and say, Lord, take me just as I am. I can come no other way. Take me deeper into you. Make my flesh life melt away. Come, Holy Spirit, in your transforming power and help me to live a life that will be not only bring happiness to myself and blessing to others, but which will bring glory to God. 
The musicians are going to come up and I'm going to say a prayer. Let's just bow our heads this morning. So much could be said, so much more. You say, well, you've said enough, and I have. But this, honestly, if, the more I get into this, the more I realize the wonder and the greatness of what God has done. We treat it sometimes as if it's just so passe. We've done it before. Hey, I tell you something now. God has got a blueprint here. He's got a means to revolutionize your life. If you only knew it, he can make you become someone you cannot even believe or imagine. Really? He can. Will you trust him today? Will you trust him? He just wants your honesty. Create in me a clean heart, God, and renew a right spirit within me. Father, you have heard us today. We worship you today as a God of goodness and greatness. A God of love and mercy and kindness who forgives all our trespasses and heals our diseases. Who bears with us in our brokenness. And by the lavish outpouring of your Holy Spirit, you desire to make us into what we've never been. And we thank you for that. When anyone becomes a Christian, they're not the same anymore. A new life has begun. Lord, in some life we pray today, you'll begin that new life. Today they'll come to you, become Christians, real Christians. And there are those many, many here today who are dear, dear Christians, loved by you and love you, really. But somehow or other are laboring under the Deception that they can do it themselves. Oh Lord, may they invite the Holy Spirit today. Holy Spirit, come amongst us now. Oh poor, fill my heart, fill my life. Fill the life of this church. Blessed, may next Sunday be a day of great ex- enthusiasm, excitement, and joy as we rejoice at the coming and the birth of our Savior. Lord Jesus, hear our prayer and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the end of this message. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about our church, please visit www.chowdean.org.uk please take a minute to rate our podcast on iTunes.